thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it is a, a bit of a, a challenge to try to put a great deal of material together, but let's see what we can do uh, with the uh, restrictions that we have on our time and so on. I'd be more than happy to answer questions. I'd really be happier to have them in the middle, but I think it's better that I talk just straight. Uh, and so uh, what I would like to do first, if Gloria, if you can put up the text of uh, Solomon Bar Simpson, Shlomo Bar Shibshon, uh, and uh, have no problem, by the way, if people write the questions in Hebrew, it's the same thing. Uh, what I want to do is this. I want to ask a question, what happened? What happened in the year 1096? Then I'm going to try to take us back and find out how we get to 1096. And in the second talk next week, what happened, a little more specifically what happened, and then what happened afterwards. And how does the whole event, the whole series of events of 1096 impinge on the rest of Jewish history? Now let's take a look at this text of Shlomo Bar Shimshon. Uh, and what we see here, uh, I presume that some of you have uh, read it. Um, he now tells us, I will now recount the events, I'm not going to read the whole text, of course. I will now recount the events of this persecution in other martyred communities. In other words, he's telling you something that happened in various places. When is he telling us this? This is very important. If I tell you what happened yesterday, it's pretty believable, right? If I tell you what happened 50 years ago, you say, well, how do you know? How do you remember these things? And that's what we have to deal with here. He's writing sometime about 50 years in the 1140s after the events. He may not even have been present. And so we have to trust him. He brings us texts. He brings us stories, what people said. He's trying to create a picture. He's trying to create an image for us. What is the image he's trying to create? He tells us it began in the year 4,856, a year in which we anticipated salvation and solace. Were there messianic rumblings in the Jewish community? Perhaps, but these are medieval chronicles, and one has to be very careful with the medieval chronicle. When we write history, if you ask me to write a history of what happened yesterday, you can be pretty sure that I know that yesterday was yesterday, and today is today, and the day before that was the day before that. That history tells us something about what happened in the past as different from what's happening now. In the medieval Middle Ages, people did not write history that way. People didn't write history. When people talk about suddenly in the 17th century, we have Jewish historians writing, wait, in 17th century, we have for the first time history. Before that, we have visions, we have ideas, we have ideals. And the same goes for the, he, for the Christian chroniclers. We're going to see at least one of them today, Raul Glaba. They're talking about what they would like to see, not what they really saw. But he is telling us some events and some things that he's telling us here, we really can uh, be uh, sure of. He tells us that at this time, arrogant people, a people of strange speech, bitter nation, a nation bitter and impetuous, Frenchman and German, wait a minute, isn't he a, a, a German himself? Because where are we talking about? We're talking about the Rhineland. Now there's a map, uh, which uh, perhaps it would be good to look at now. Brewery, can you put up the map, please? Um, are we okay here? Um, okay, there's a map. Now it, it's not the world's greatest map, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but you can see that map. It's, it's Western Europe, uh, roughly in the Middle Ages. And if you see a line down the middle, I don't have a pointer, but you can see, you see the, the big word holy and Roman. And in between it, you see the Rhine River. Uh, yes, very good. The, oh, great. You have, a, you have a pointer. That's the Rhine, the Rhine River. And we have the towns of Spire, Worms, and Mainz, going from the south to the north, and then, and then Frankfurt. Now, something very important to realize is that when people travel from Mainz to the east, they, they get with a little bit of struggle, they take a, a river from uh, the mine, they portage a little, and they get to the Danube. And the Danube gets to where? The Black Sea. It's a long way. Crusaders are going to go to the east from the center of Germany. They're not going to go down and cross the Alps. The Alps are very hard to cross. 
Even today, they're very hard to cross. The first tunnel was in the 1960s, the famous Mont Blanc tunnel. Uh, and and it, it was very hard. I won't go through it all now. And so the people, if the, the, the people congregated in Mainz, where we're going to find out the worst slaughter took place, it was only natural because from there they could easily get to the Danube River and just float down to the Black Sea and then out through uh, uh, the past past Istanbul and get themselves to the uh, Holy Land, quote unquote, without having to do too many trials. So this is the place, this is the center of where things happen. And he tells us Frenchmen and Germans, well, those are kind of funny terms at this point, but he means people who've come from France, people who come from white, people from the north and south, they're all congregating in this particular place. Now, what did they do? They went to seek their house of idolatry. Well, we now know what Christianity was in Jewish eyes. Not very, uh, not, not very praiseworthy to say the least. And I think probably some of you know that that is the situation. Anyway, they went to see there, and it had been desecrated by the barbaric hosts. Who were they? The Muslims. Uh, why he's calling them barbaric, I don't know. And they put a profane symbol, a cross, uh, on themselves. They, and they went to follow the stray path to the grave of their Messiah. Actually, the Hebrew there is Gilu Lehem, which has been interpreted as the droppings of their Messiah. And if you may know the word from, the, from Sefer Yechezkel. Uh, now it came to pass as they passed through the towns where Jews dwelled, they said to one another, look now, why are we going such a long way to do this? We have the Jews here and the Jews killed him. It's translated here, I think, for no reason. It should be for no justification. Let's avenge ourselves on them and exterminate them from among the nations so that the name of Israel uh, be blotted out. Okay. They are, they are coming and they are going, they're intentionally going to kill the Jews. What do the Jews do? The Jews take their traditional modes. What are these traditional modes? They are when the Jewish community became aware of their intentions, they resorted to the custom of our ancestors, repentance, prayer, and charity. We all know that. We all go to shul on, on, on Rosh Hashanah, or Yom Kippur, we've certainly been there. Not the gzera itself. They don't get rid of it, but they at least take the sting out of it. The worst part. They lead you to understand why it's happening. Uh, and, and in fact, that's exactly what, what happens here. They, they did it, but it didn't help because it was so bitter. It was so terrible that our strength flagged. We fasted and it didn't work. He's, he's actually mocking the Jews for this thing. Everything was so terrible that happened to us. But wait a minute, wait a minute. What about the Christians? How did they perceive this thing? It's very interesting because Christians observing this, this massacre, this slaughter, people who were formal members of the church, they said, wait a minute, what's going on? Let me read to you from a Christian chronicler something you don't have. These people burned with fire. He's talking about the Crusaders and the love of God. They took with them all their money and possessions. But along the route, wild goings on commenced and knew no limit. For these would-be Crusaders did not keep their distance from deceitful men, from sinners and from criminals. In other words, there's a clash here, isn't there? The, the Jewish chronicler says, these are terrible people. They're, they're awful. They're barbaric. They, 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 they come from wherever, and they're, they're attacking us. And here is a Christian saying the same thing. We shouldn't think this is all the Christians against all the Jews. It's far more complex th than that. Uh, and uh, they, this bunch sinned further and disgustingly, this crowd of pilgrim fools. They spoke of a goose as though it had the spirit of God upon it. And they said the same of a goat. Then a spirit of cruelty came upon them. Perhaps this was the will of God, note, of course, uh, and the fruit of confused thinking. They took vengeance on the Jews and carried out an awful slaughter, especially in Lotharingia. That is exactly where we were pointing to, the Rhineland. And they said that this was the beginning of their pilgrimage and the first fulfilling of vows against the enemies of the Christian faith. Now, this is certainly not 
not what uh, the, the establishment, the Christian establishment wanted. The Christian establishment was not ready to see Jews massacred and slaughtered in this way. So what was this all about? Why do we have this incredible picture in Hebrew? The Hebrew, by the way, it's, it's, it's not an easy Hebrew. I will tell you that right now. And, and in fact, when, uh, when I teach this Hebrew, when you teach it to Israeli students who are native speakers, of course, they say, well, this Hebrew is hard. It's, it's, it's not what we're used to reading because Hebrew is what it was at that point. But it is, it is, it is what we have. And we, we, are, we are faced here with, a, with an, an incredible picture of Jews and Christians, both deriding these people who do these things. And by the way, Shlomo Bar Shimshon himself takes the story of the goose and he inserts it into his chronicle, which means he was reading the Christian chronicles or else where else would he have known these stories? Uh, so that it's a terrible thing that happened. The Christian establishment opposes it, but did it really? That's the question we wanna ask. Does, does all this anger, all this attack, all this wild mayhem against the Jews? And then the Jewish reaction, because I'm sure many of you have heard the term Kiddush Hashem, of the people who killed themselves rather than convert, which is what fills the Chronicle of Shlomo Bar Shimshon. And by the way, this isn't just men. This is very interesting. I once took a time to count how many men are heroes in this story and how many women are heroes in the story. The number is almost equal. It's mothers slaughtering their children, just as fathers slaughter their children. So that there's something very egalitarian almost about this story. All Jews are martyrs, all Jews die for Kiddush Hashem. Okay, so where do we get to it? Why do Jews perceive Christianity this way? Indeed, if we were to make a study of a, a Hebrew chronicle, a Hebrew report against a Christian report, we would find ourselves amazingly with inversion stories. The Christians say one thing, the Jews say the reverse. The Christians tell the story of a Jew plotting with a waxen image to kill a bishop, the Jews tell the story of a renegade Jew who plants a waxen image to try to make the Christians think the Jews are trying to kill them. In other words, there's really uh, an intersection of two societies here understanding each other. They didn't agree. Let's look at this. Usually we're told, Let's now find out how we get to Shlomo Shabbat Shimshon. And the Chronicle, by the way, is 30 some pages long in Hebrew, and we're not going to go into it, although next week we'll take a short look at one small piece of it again. Why, how do we get here? Well, if you've read typical stories of what goes on to the Jews in the Middle Ages, we're told that in the early Middle Ages, things were pretty quiet. There was a theory called the Augustinian theory. And according to this theory, the Jews were to be protected. The Jews were witnesses to Christian truth and therefore things went well. And, in, and indeed things were not so bad in the early middle ages to put it mildly, but also not so good. And that's the point. And the question is, is there really such a theory as this? because the theory says, well, things were okay. And then suddenly in 1096, the messianism of the crusade, the speech delivered by Pope Urban II in the year 1095 in the city of Clermont in the center, south center of France, just brought people to go into wild reactions like Albert of I, the chronicle that I read, the Christian chronicle, like he described. Could it be that a whole society suddenly goes crazy? Is it really possible? We've seen a lot of things in our time, but I don't think we've seen really people, the whole society going crazy. Oh, yes, I know there are a lot of theories going on today and so, so on and so forth, but we have not seen, with one terrible exception, of course, real craziness. So what's going on here? Was there an Augustinian theory? And the answer is absolutely not. It's, it's, Somebody pointed out to me a week ago, uh, a, a person in France named um, Capucine Nemo Peckelman, 
she said to me, look, this comes from a historian named Jean Juster from the early, from the late 19th century. He tried to understand things and he said, well, Augustine, we all know who Augustine is, I think, St. Augustine, he's one of the great fathers of the church. Uh, St. Augustine said, well, it says in Psalm uh, 59, do not kill them lest my people forget. And therefore everybody said, yes, we can't attack the Jews. We can't do this against the Jews. But in fact, this is not at all really what we have here because what Augustine really said was the Christians are spiritual and the Jews are carnal. What does that mean carnal? He was suggesting that there are two sides to a world that the word that, that the Christians somehow or other have, have, have left behind their physical human identity, uh, physical identity principally, and they've adopted, they become spiritual beings. Whereas the Jews are carnal, they're of this world. Now, if you have carnality and spirituality, you have to prevent the carnality from, be, from affecting, from infecting, in fact, from impurifying the, uh, the uh, uh, carnal. And this is really Augustine's theory. But Augustine then ends up by saying, but you know, we have to persuade the Jews to become one with us. And we have to do this by preaching. But what he called the, the, the sweetness of lips. So we have, to, we have to do this. And therefore people took this, well, this is what he said. But Augustine actually said something else. Not only were the Jews carnal, but the Jews were, 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 uh, were kapsari. What is a kapsarius? A kapsarius is a slave, a, an older slave who carried the books of the young Roman schoolboy. That's what the Jews do. The Jews bring the Tanakh with them. They, they bring the Torah. And therefore, they prove what? The Christianity is true. Oh, you didn't know that. Where do we get this? For this, we have to go to Paul. Uh, uh, you all know Paul. Uh, and, and, and by the way, before I leave Augustine, I, what I want to say is that, there's a, that the reason why I reject this very standard view of an Augustinian theory is very simply because there is so much more beginning with Paul, St. Paul, as the Christians call him, and continuing with all kinds of church law, canon law, it's called, which develops over time, as well as Roman law, the law of the Romans, which, uh, uh, which, which develops uh, uh, over time and which becomes Christianized over time. And that really sets the limits, the parameters of Jewish existence. And we have to ask the question, could this possibly lead to what we see uh, in the, uh, in the uh, Crusades. So let's take a look at Paul, um, people in your uh, course pack, whatever, you could slide down. I don't know, um, Guri, if you want to pull up uh, the text of Paul. Uh, okay, now we're still in Shlomo Bar Shimshon. We're going down to number two. Um, further down, 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 down. Who is Paul? Paul was a genius. Like him or dislike him, he was perhaps one of the greatest minds of all time. Because what did he do? He took something called Judaism, early rabbinic Judaism, and he turned it into something that it was not. That it was not. And that took a big stretch of the imagination. In Judaism, we have filial li lineage, Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and it continues onward. And we follow by being part of a people, which is what Judaism is. It's uh, being part of a people, whether you observe or don't observe, it's being part of a people. However, you're a part of that people, including by joining the people from outside. And you don't have to be born, but you are someone who says this is Judaism, and Judaism is constructed on the basis of somehow or other following the ways of the 
Torah, the Torah as it is written, whether one observes Kashrut or Shabbat or whatever, one recognizes these things. Paul comes along and in a letter he wrote called the Epistle to the Romans, it's in the New Testament, I strongly urge everybody to read the Epistle to Romans because in many ways, all of Western society is built on Paul's Epistle to the Romans. And what does Paul say? He says, and these are chapter nine to 11 in particular, where he turns his attention to Jews. Why does he turn his attention to Jews? Who is he writing to? He's writing to people in Rome. Paul lives slightly after Jesus, about the year 40, 50. Remember, he himself began as a Pharisee. And he writes to them and he says, you know, you people have a problem with the Jewish Christians. Who are the Jewish Christians? Jews who decided to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, who felt that to be a Christian meant also to keep observing mitzvot. And the Christians in Rome are saying, no, wait a minute, we are supposed to be free of the mitzvot. So Paul tries to come as an intermediary between them. And what does he do? He says that the Jews make a terrible mistake. They think that filiation is physical, father, son, father, son, mother, daughter, and so on. Rather, filiation is spiritual. It's through belief. One achieves, and now his innovation, salvation through belief. Now, wait a minute. If one is a Jew and asks himself, what in the world does Paul mean by salvation? Generally, you come up with a thought of, I don't know what he's talking about. At least I do. I don't, I don't observe mitzvot or not observe them for the sake of achieving salvation of my soul. Now, there are a period of Judaism, maybe among the Jews of Amsterdam in the 16th or 17th century who are all ex Moranos, and they do talk about salvation, and they do talk about eternal punishment for a sinning soul, which is also Protestant, not Catholic, but let's leave that aside. We, we, we observe because it says in the Torah, observe, and either you accept it or you reject it, but you don't think I'm endangering my, 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 my mortal soul. Paul tells you you're endangering your mortal soul. Paul tells you, if you believe in Jesus, you will attain eternal peace. And that is why in the church, in the Catholic church, you are baptized, you become a part of this people, this Christian people, and you believe. And therefore, you will achieve salvation. This is Paul's message. And it's a problematic message, isn't it? Because it's a Jewish message and it's a Christian message at the same time. It's a different message. He's He's taken the innards of Judaism and turned them around. And not only that, but he's saying that Christianity is the continuation of Judaism. It is no longer, it's, it's, it, it's as though the Jews stop being Jews. God says, I, I choose, according to Paul, who are my children? The, the, not the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. My children are the children of belief. Who would that be? All the Christians. But then Paul goes on further. That's Romans, what I just read. Then Paul, actually before Romans, Romans is sort of a, a, uh, an attempt to, to get out of what he said earlier in two other letters. One is Galatians and one is Corinthians. And in, uh, and in Galatians, he said, in Corinthians, he said, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, there are two books of Corinthians, chapter 10, verse 17. We are one bread in Christ that we may have one heart. Sicut unus panis sumus in Christo, sicut unum cor debemus habere. We are one bread, even though we are many. Now, wait a minute, what does that mean? Paul is seeking a unity, a unity. Does anybody among you, if you were, we were alive, I would ask you to see if you could get an answer. Has anybody seen this idea expressed in secular terms? Oh, you have. Take a dollar bill, turn it over. A pluribus unum, from many we are one. This is the core notion of Western society, to try to achieve a unity, 
a unity of people, a unity of belief. And we must be careful not to be contaminated by contact with things that are outside. And Paul explains this what it, what further on as he goes on. He says, and um, yes, you have this. Paul spoke of the little leaven, the fermentation that can spoil the whole lump. The leaven of corruption and wickedness that ruins the true unleavened Passover matzah. What's the Passover matzah? He means the Eucharist. He doesn't mean the matzah, the physical matzah. He means the, the sacrament of Christianity. And he's worried about contact and interference. And this is a very special kind of thing. Paul is building a very interesting theology. He's telling us that the Jews aren't the true believers, that the true believers are Christians. But then he turns around in Romans and he said, but you know, we need the Jews. Because without the Jews, we will not know when the end of days is upon us. Because when the end of days come, all the Jews will turn around and convert. This is chapter 11 in Romans, verses 27, 28. This is what he said. But in the meantime, he says, um, we, we have to unite and be one. What is this going to imply for the Jews as we go on in the rest of the Middle Ages? And in fact, even to today, it's going to imply that one has to be very careful in relations with Jews. The Jews, in the words of a historian, Gavin Langmuir, a Jew was a Jew, legally, theologically, however you approached him. The Jew was something in her. The Jew was something different. So Jews can be a part of society, and yet we are very suspect of the Jew of society. And he says, you have to know that your bodies are limbs and organs of Christ. Shall I then take from Christ his bodily parts and make them over to a harlot? No, don't link yourself with a harlot. Who's the harlot? It's not here in this text. I'm reading something else. Sorry. It's, 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 something, it's something else. It's, it's, it, it, he, he means by the harlot, he means Judaism. He means anything that's contact. Now, actually, he didn't really mean Judaism itself. He meant Christians who behave like Jews. He talked about circumcision. He said, if you circumcise yourself, your faith is imperfect. What we're building here is a whole structure of fear of Jews. In other words, when we come and we come, if we, we take an Augustinian theory that everything was good because they said the Jews are witnesses and suddenly it went bad, we're forgetting this part. There was a great deal of concern about who the Jew was and what contact would be. Something else that's not here, he said, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ. If you know what the Eucharist is, that's it. And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, we share the one loaf. This is it. Who can participate in the temple sacrifice? Guess where Paul got this from? Ezekiel 44.7. Yechezkel, Sefer Yechezkel. In other words, there's a notion of purity and joining, and that is what uh, is necessary to be part of the Christian world. It gets expressed a little more crudely, speaking directly against Jews, by the late fourth century John Chrysostom. Guru, if you can go down a little more. Late fourth century, he says this. Um, Uh, of people having problem. I'm not moving anything near my microphone, sorry. Um, but he says in the, in the commentary um, to, to uh, his homilies against the Jews, Chrysostom was in Antioch. Now Antioch was a very difficult place. It's in the late fourth century. The world, Roman world had just become Christian. And a lot of Christians couldn't differentiate between Jews and Christians. Uh, who was a Jew, who was a Christian? And somebody discovered that the bones of the Maccabees, some of the Maccabees, had been buried in Antioch. And people were going there and uh, worshiping. them. That's how, strangely, August 31st is the saint's day in the Christian church of the Maccabees. The only Old Testament figures, to use the term Old Testament, which I don't normally use, uh, to, to, who actually are saints in the church. 
But what does he say? He's trying to convince these Christians there's something wrong about the Jews. And he says, although these Jews had been called to the adoption of sons, they were God's children, they felt a kinship with dogs. We who were dogs received the strength through God's grace to put aside the irrational nature which was ours and to rise to the son, honor of sons. How do I prove this? Christ said, it is not fair to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. Christ was speaking to the Canaanite woman when he called the Jews children and the Gentiles dogs. But see how after the order was changed, they became dogs and we became children. This is what is called the doctrine of supersession. The Christianity took the place of Jews and the Christianity says, you see, we have traditions in Jews. The only thing is that Christianity is saying that that tradition is really ours and that the Jews are in error for not following. Now, of course, modern Christianity, the modern church has gone completely in a, in a very different way. It's trying in some ways to make way to live parallel with Jews. Uh, perhaps they've succeeded, perhaps they haven't succeeded. This isn't for us to discuss here. But indeed, this was the way. There is a world in which there are Christians, there's a world in which there are Jews, and the Jews are the dogs. And dogs, as you know, are possible sources of filth, of excrement, and of contamination. So we're building a picture here early on. Remember, this is the fourth century already, Crusades of the 11th. That's a long time. And we, 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 there's a funny, funny kind of trend, funny kind of thing that people do. When they, or when, when, when they look at history, say what happened in the last four months since Joe Biden became president, they see a lot of things and they see a lot of differences. And they go back to December, uh, November of 2020 and say, oh, well, the whole world was different and so many things have happened. When we go back 700 years, we act as though it's one day. It's, it's, a, it's a game we play with our minds. And it's something that professional historians, not just you know, the average person who reads some history, professional historians have to really struggle to make sure that they don't collapse 700 years into seven hours. And be very careful, it's a long time. But what I'm saying is that the origin is there and it's something that one has to be very careful of. Now, how does this get explained? Because we have here an ambivalent position, don't we? Paul on the one hand says, we want to live with Jews. Uh, we need the Jews. He actually says, we need them. We can't do without them. That's really what Augustine is talking about. Augustine says, yeah, but they're really carnal. Augustine comes after Chrysostom, by the way. He's at the end of the fourth, he dies in fifth century, 425. Chrysostom says, they're dogs. We're getting a picture of a true uh, difference. Um, now, now, therefore, uh, we, we, we have to try to find exactly, you know, how this plays out. Well, um, the, let's, let's look at Gregory the Great. I know we're moving fast, we're moving over a lot of material here, but I'm trying to create a picture for you of how we get to 1096. Now we're talking about Pope Gregory the Great. Who was Pope Gregory the Great? Yeah, it's, it's like Groucho Marx, who's buried in Grant's tomb, where Pope Gregory the Great was a pope. Uh, and uh, he was a Roman noble. He was also attached to the emperor of Rome, who at this time was actually in Byzantium, and he was his agent. And he knew there were Roman laws, and the Roman laws made Jews citizens, among other things, which meant they had civil rights. Gregory has to protect them. But at the same time, he is a pope. And as Shakespeare would have put it, a pope by any other name is still a pope. What happens here? He's only pope for a very brief time, but he wrote a great deal on the Jews. He wrote about 25 uh, papal letters. We call them inaccurately bulls. The bull is just the lead seal that's attached to the letter. He wrote about 25 letters on Jews. And what's important is that between the time of Gre before Gregory, we have almost nothing. And after Gregory, until the 11th century, we have almost nothing. Three papal letters entirely, and one has to be very careful in saying what papal policy was in those interim 
about 600 years, what are 600 years between the words? Well, Gregory wrote letters. And let's look at the letter he wrote in 391. Uh, it, it's it's uh, June of, how can it be June of 391? That's some kind of misprint. Uh, because uh, he's uh, at the end of the sixth century. It says, through the opportunity of a suitable time to writing to you, he's writing to people in Arles and Marseille. We all know where Arles and Marseille are, right? I mean, Arles, maybe not, but Marseille, you know, it's the French Riviera. Uh, and uh, he said, people have written in what happened. He heard from Jews resident in Rome. Remember, Jews are in Rome. When did Jews get to Rome? Before Julius Caesar's, a long time before Julius Caesar. The one thing about the Roman Jewish community which is unlike any other Jewish community in the world, except, of course, Medinat uh, Israel, Eretz Israel, but we won't talk about that. The one thing about the Jews of Rome is that they are not immigrants. Wherever else Jews are in Europe, Asia, they're immigrants, they've come in. The Jews in Rome were there before everyone else. They're, 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 they're probably more ancient, which is why people today, you go to the ghetto in Rome and people say, let's go eat authentic Roman food. They want to eat, they want to eat Jewish food, some of which is authentically Jewish, some of which is just traditionally Roman, which has become identified with the Jews. So the popes and the Jews have a very long history together. It's not that the Jews came in and were brought in by the popes, just as Jews came in other places. The Jews were there. The Jews had constant contact with the popes. We're not talking about the big city of Rome. And in any case, the Jews were living close to the main arteries of the city, the main commercial arteries of the city. If you've ever been in Rome and you've been in the ghetto and you get to take a map of Rome, you see that it cuts, cuts the, the, the city commercially exactly in half. It also was feudal nobles exactly in half, which is a very interesting thing. Anyway, Gregory, uh, writes writes to, to them and, he's, and he writes and he said, you know, we have, we have uh, uh, people coming here and who have said that uh, th there, is, there is a real problem because people are being forced to convert. Where do I want to get the text? The, the one, oh, you, you have here, it's, it's uh, you fortunately took what I sent and blew it up. Um, and he said, they've come and they've reported that some Jews have been forced to convert. We can't have this. Um, we we can't. They can't. Somebody asked to show the text of Romans eleven twenty seven. I'm sorry, we, it's not among the uh, the texts that I put up, but it's the easiest thing to find. Just go to the New Testament and find it. Um, they they've been traveling to Marseille and they've been heard that people have been brought to the font of baptism more by force than by preaching. Now I consider the intention to be worthy of praise, convert people, but I fear lest adequate justification occurs, no profitable effect will occur. Because those who are brought to baptism, not by the sweetness of preaching, but by compulsion, returns to his former superstition and dies the worse for having been born again. Now this is a, a very important thing. In other words, can Jews live in the Christian world? Gregory is saying, absolutely. We want to bring them in, but we can't use force on them. But what happened in the Crusades? They used force on them. But there's something else here. In the second letter, which unfortunately, uh, I didn't get the whole thing printed out for you, which I should have. He's, we're told about a confiscation of a synagogue in the city of Palermo. Palermo, Sicily, of course, far out, far from Rome. Uh, and the Pope said, wait a minute, you, you can't just do this. You can't just take things from Jews. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, the, the priest there quickly consecrated it as a church. Gregory was furious because, um, uh, be, because Greg, Gregory was furious because this violated the laws of the church and it put him on a spot. That which had been made holy to Christianity was holy. It couldn't be de-sanctified. You can't de-sanctify a church and turn it into a synagogue. This is a, a big, big violation, so to speak. So, so that uh, all he does, he offers them some money. He, or by the way, along the line refers to Jewish prayers and he calls them a bunch of noise. And this becomes a standard trope you can see it throughout the Middle Ages. Jewish prayers are noise, strepitum. 
just just yelling and crashing and, and I don't know what else. So that um, the, the um, wait, just hold a second. That does that, robot calls. Uh, the, the, uh, so, so he establishes two principles here, which carry us on along the line we're following. That the Jews are to be brought to Christianity, but not by force, but Christianity always takes precedence. It becomes categorized as something called the ratio fide, the reason of the faith. The reason of the faith always takes precedence when there is a clash. And so Gregory's letters, which really set the tone, Gregory talks about Jews owning Christian slaves. Gregory talks about the Jews as citizens with rights, which they were in Rome because there was still Roman law. Gregory talks about Jews uh, having, having uh, Christian wet nurses. Gregory talks about Jews having Christian slaves in their, in their farms or, or people who were sharecroppers. And he's furious about it. He says, you are giving a kick, calcificare. Did anyone knows Italian calcio is football, it's soccer. Uh, the word is calcificando in Latin. They're, they're, giving a, they're, they're kicking Christianity. And so there is a tension in Christianity that builds up here. It's not a simple thing. The tension begins in Paul. It carries into Chrysostom. It goes over to Gregory the Great. Now, I see that uh, our time is running faster than I thought it was, but we can still move on and see something even stronger because this tension is going to get itself really tied up with people who become very upset with Jews, who become really fearful of Jews. In other words, what I'm, where I'm trying to go with this in the few minutes that are remaining is this, to say that when we get to the Crusades and we see this attack, which a Christian establishment figure like Albert of X, who I read that, that he comes and he condemns, nonetheless, it's something that's built into Christianity to begin with. It's not something that it's a surprise. It's been controlled. How has it been controlled? Well, for one thing, Jews have been, and I should mention this indeed, uh, you, you can go back and look at the map, but just keep it in your heads. Jews were living all through Western Europe. Somebody mentioned, weren't Jews in Spain at the time of the Romans? Indeed, they were. Not only were they, but they were identified as part of the Roman population. And the Jews in Spain in the sixth century experienced one of the worst episodes of all in Jewish history. The so-called barbarian tribes, the Visigoths came in, conquered the Iberian Peninsula and joined the church. And they decided that they were going to unify the peninsula because only by unification could they control it because they were a minority. They, they forced everyone to become a Catholic. They forced, there were no Protestants, of course. They forced everyone to follow a new law code called the Visigothic Code. And they forced all the Jews to convert. They literally forced them all to convert. And you see a certain ambivalence among the churchmen on this. They actually liked it, but they couldn't condone it. And so they talk about a hazy seal of the king who brought the Jews to convert. And they tried everything. They made the Jews swear that they would, they, they, if, they, if they couldn't eat pork, at least they would eat food cooked in pork. Uh, that they would swear to be Christians. And you find the codes talking about Jews, baptized Jews. What's a baptized Jews? Jews who have been forcibly to be baptized, but guess what? All Jews were baptized and referred to as Hebraeus afterwards anyway. You can't escape. And, and it's, it's an amazing, amazing thing. And we could spend plenty of time on it and I just don't have it to spend here today. But this is an episode which sets a precedent. Why? Because one of the things they said was, how do we know we can force someone, we can't force someone to become a Christian, but once someone has received baptism, which can't be erased, it's an indelible mark, it's on your soul, it's there forever, you can't remove it if you've been baptized, according to Catholic doctrine. How do we make them stay Christian? And the answer was, well, we are constant. It's evident if someone for, hasn't protested for three or four months, then they've accepted it and they're Christians, and they have to be made Christians all their lives. What's important, what was said at the fourth Toledan Council in the year 638 for us? Because in the year 1790, 
this council is still being cited as the fourth Poland council in order to make sure that Jews who've converted stay Christians. And it happens to be applied in Rome at this point. It becomes legal doctrine all the way through, all the way through. So in other words, not only do we have the ambivalence that I'm talking about, but we have a certain concept that there are people on one side, people who move to another side from Christian Judaism into Christianity, and they have to be made to stay Christians. Now, Gregory the Great said to us, wait a minute, they're gonna go back because Gregory the Great hasn't quite gotten to the point where this is going to become really a doctrine. But in fact, in fact, ultimately it will be. And this, when we begin to see our, our material next week, is going to be an issue because there are going to be all kinds of Jews. If you read Shlomo Bar Shimshon, we like to think that everyone committed suicide and everyone died, but he tells us a lot of people converted and what happened. And we're going to see what he says about that. In other words, we're really building a problem here. It's not something that happens out of the blue in 1096. It's something with a big, big background. And it's also a background with a lot of animus. Let's move to Agobard of Lyon very briefly. Um, okay, Agobard, Saint Agobard, was a very important person in Lyon. If you had the map again, you could see Lyon is, is, is like the center of France. If you've ever been in France and taken the train, you know that that say from, from Switzerland or wherever, it's two hours on the, uh, the fast train to Lyon and then two hours from Lyon to Paris. So when you're in Lyon, you really have a great deal of influence throughout the country. Agobard had a big fight with the secular head, the king, Louis the Pious. And what is Agobard's problem? He feels that Louis is being very good to Jews because secular rulers and sometimes secular rulers who were bishops, Oh, one of the things I could have brought you was a charter from a bishop from 1084 in Spire, just in the Rhineland, 12 years before the crusade. I'm inviting Jews to come. They're merchants. I'm going to settle them properly. I'm going to protect them. I'm going to give them rights. I'm going to bring them, treat them as people who have special rights. You find this in Louis the Pious himself, giving rights. So once the Visigothic episode is over, over why? Because the Arabs invaded Spain in the year 711 and that ended the Visigothic reign. So, uh, but Jews are in France. They don't get to England until William the Conqueror in 1066. Jews are in Germany, not yet in Poland. That's, uh, that's an early modern thing. And in Italy, they're, they're all over. And uh, they are being treated with a certain respect. They're, they're merchants. This is the feudal period. It's a difficult period. Not all merchants are Jews, as used to be said, but a lot of Jews are merchants. And they're certainly in the Rhineland. Uh, Shlomo Bar Shimshon will tell us that the Jews were, were betrayed by their makarim. Some people translate this as friends. It doesn't mean friends. It means sodalis in Latin. It means they're partners. Jews have business partnerships with Christians. And this is going to get broken up by the Crusades. But in any case, the Jews were, were, were being welcomed. Uh, on one hand, and feared by other people on the other. Look at what Agobard has to say. Let's take a, a quick look at, at, at what Agobard has to say. Um, uh, I should bring you into Raoul Glaber, but uh, just let's look at this thing that he said to the emperor, remove the impedimentum from the Holy Church, the Jews, their existence. It translates in Hebrew as mokesh, by the way, uh, to, from, from the, they're, they're blocking the church. Omnipotent God has long since prescribed and preordained that you should serve as the pious rector in the future times of peril and the end of days. And this is where we are now. And your Misi, your agents, are showing themselves good to Christians and fierce to Jews, very fierce to Jews, very fierce to Christians, namely Agobard himself. And don't you know that the most reverend fathers, Gallican fathers of the church, Buria, can you raise that a little, uh, enjoined against all social fraternization, prohibited anyone from becoming impure, impure through fraternization and dining with the Jews from breaking bread with any of our priests, called it a sacrilege for Christians to partake foods. 
and the Jews call our foods impure. We Catholics should begin to be inferior to the Jews if we eat the things which they serve. And Jews go out on the street during Holy Week. That is, they observe the Eucharist passing and they cast doubt on it and fun on it. And they probably did. They are a match for the evil of Antichrist. So we must pursue them. Now look, and then, but then he says, oh no, but I remember what Gregory the Great and the whole body of, there's a whole body of church law, which is building up to said, we have to be proper with it. Look at this. We're building up a whole body of thought and belief, which says the Jews are creating impurity in our society. Now, when you have Shlomo Bar Shimshon, have people come and say, why are we here? They, they crucified him. They're terrible. There's a background to it. How it gets from people like Agobard, who's a bishop, to this riffraff that comes and attacks the Jews in the towns, we're not so sure. But it's clear it's there. And now let's just take one minute more to, um, let's take just one, one minute more here to look at uh, Raoul Glaber, uh, very briefly. Glaber was a, uh, a myth maker really in the in the early uh, 11th century. And he talks about, look at this weird text. The word of the attack on the church of the Holy Sepulchre spread through the whole world. And by the common consent of all Christians, it was decreed that Jews should be chased out of the lands and cities where they dwelled. And thus they were and were slaughtered. And then a few lines down, he says, but the Jews appeared again. And it was decreed by the bishops that no Christian should be associated with the Jew unless the Jew expressed a desire to convert. Well, this is in good Hebrew, matzutz it's just, it's, 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 it's a fantasy. All of Glauber's work has been studied very carefully by a fine historian named Brian Stock. And, but you see what's happening. This is before the Crusades. This is early 11th century, 70, 80 years before. There is a thought that we have to get rid of the Jews. Wouldn't it be nice if they could be thrown out and, 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 and slaughtered because they weren't. And then of course they clearly weren't because if you look at the text then they say, well, no Christian should associate with the Jews. They're afraid of contact with the Jews. We're, we're in a incredibly difficult situation. But at the same time, let's look at the last text which is just in Latin. Not, not, not Werner, we'll come back to that. Rupert, we'll come back to that next week. Keep going down to number to number six. This is it, just that brief lap. Things were clearly getting difficult. We won't have time now. I see I really have to finish up uh, the picture of the Jew of Bourges and what that is, of the, of which is perfectly for the Crusades, the Jew throwing his son into the fire. But Pope Alexander II in Rome wrote this line, which became immortal in the canons. It's not just one time only. Disparni mirum est judeorum et sericenorum causa. The cause, the state, the situation of the Jews and the Saracens is different, are so different. In elos enim qui Christianus persecuntu et ex urbubus propius. The others throw the Jews out, throw the, throw the Christians out of their towns. These ones, he, the Jews, ubi parati sunt servire. They are ready to serve everywhere. People translate that means slave. He doesn't mean slave. He means to follow the canons, let the church set the tone. There is a problem growing, a real problem growing based on all this material that I brought together for you in the last 45 minutes. I know it's been a ton of material, but at least I want you to carry away from this that there wasn't a good Middle Ages followed by the Crusades and the bad Middle Ages. There was a whole series of thoughts, a whole series of doctrines, and even the popes in the 11th century said, we have to find some way to make sure that people are not attacking Jews and forcibly converting. And this letter was sent to a leader, a prince in Benevento, that's in Southern Italy, telling him stop attacking Jews and stop forcibly converting them in the year 1065. Enough for today. Thank you very much, Professor Stowe. Um, I can't speak for everyone, but I think this is a period in history which is, isn't as uh, known to everyone. So thank you for enlightening us. Um, this is time if anyone has questions, you can use a chat and maybe Professor Stowe, you'd like to say a few words about what's coming up for us next week. Well, um, what's, what's coming up next week? I've sort of, you know, I wanna go on. Where, where do these images go? 
what happens? What happens when you wind up with a bunch of Jews who have been converted and then want to go back to Judaism? There, there, there are some great novels by a woman named Sharon Newman, S-H-A-R-A-N, called like The Devil's Door, that's one I read for before it was published, in which she has Jews consorting with family members who've been converted and are sort of going back or not going back to, uh, uh, to, uh, to Judaism. But it was a real problem, and we will see that it was a real problem and where it's going to carry us and where the implications for the rest of uh, uh, Jewish life in the Middle Ages. Okay, I see a lot of thank yous on the chat, but I guess things are pretty clear. Um, okay, so uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Oh, let's see, Yaakov has a question. Did the Crusaders cross nowadays Romania on the way to the Black Sea? Oh, I love that question because that's one of the things that I figured out. It says, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk next week about a character named Emiko, who everyone loves to hate. Uh, I wrote a whole article about it. Uh, and um, he, along with the Crusaders, they got to a place which in Hebrew, it's called Italia Sheliavan, Italy of Greece. And people say, oh, that must be Magna Grecia, which is uh, Sicily. Nothing doing. Ain't dubim ben it's about Dalmatia, Carinthia, because the Roman Emperor Empire, the Eastern Empire, got to, if you know where Dalmatia is, Croatia. It's uh, the Croatians, the Croatians, the Montenegro are Montenegrins. It's the most beautiful places you can ever imagine. I, I strongly urge a tourist visit to these places when we get healthy again. Mm -hmm. but, but, but they got there, and Emiko was simply made into hamburger meat. Uh, the by by the local princes they didn't want this guy it's uh, it's just outside of Bratislava uh, the uh, the confluence of the, the uh, Leita and another river right there and the, and and it was all muddy and the, and the Jews get stuck in the mud I mean not the Jews the, the Emiko and his people get stuck in the mud and uh, Shlomo Bar Shinshon sees it as a, kind, as a kind of reverse Baptist they were unbaptized by this muddy water and they were all slaughtered. Okay, thank you. Bev wants to know what was the tipping point in 1096? The tipping point? Well, that, that is what we, 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 we don't quite know. I mean, things like this, like this happened. What, is, what has it brought about the attack on the Capitol in, uh, on January 6th, the Washington Capitol in, in, in January 6th? Was it the speech that they heard beforehand? Had they planned it? Previously, uh, I mean that's why it's so so terribly important to understand what happened and who was responsible for it. I'm not, you know, not going anywhere. There was a clearly an attack on the Capitol. It wasn't a tourist visit. Believe me, I saw it. I was there watching the whole thing, every inch of it. Uh, and uh, uh, but but we, we, we what was the tipping point? What brought it to that? Well, there were a whole lot of reasons, and that's what I'm trying to show that. We, we can't just say it came out of, you know, it wasn't a yesh mei and something created from nothing. There was something there. There was a whole doctrine, a whole set of laws, a whole set of principles that you, you came too close to a Jew, you could be contaminated. You didn't eat a Jew's food. You have no idea. I'm writing about that meat in the Roman ghetto now in the 17th and 18th century, how they had to stand on their heads because Jews couldn't possibly eat meat without participation with Christian butchers. Uh, and, uh, and, and the way the laws worked on this thing. So that tipping point, I don't know. I mean, there's, there, there's an argument that, that all this happened and the Jews watched when the Christians saw the Jews killing their children, the Christians got angry with the Jews and say, see, we won't protect you anymore because there are things like this in the Chronicle. But in fact, it's there before. And when next week, when we talk about the Jew of Bourges, uh, which, which is an isolated story, it was all over the place. Uh, we will see that that is the archetype of, of everything, the Jew, would rather his children die than let them become Christians. This is very firm doctrine. Um, a few, sorry. And is a request, can you repeat again the name of the author and the books? Of, of which, which author? You mentioned which? just before, um, you just mentioned the novel just before this question. Oh, 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 oh yes. 
Sharon, Sharon Newman, do I have a copy of it here? Sharon I, I, Newman, okay. Yeah, N-E-W-M-A-N, yeah. It's, it's, a, it, it, it's, it's fun to read these books anyway, regardless of whether, I mean, you know, they're, they're clearly exaggerated, um, uh, but, uh, but, but, uh, but you, you have to reflect upon them. There's another series of books, Mary, what's her name? Rashi's Daughters. It's also, it's fiction uh, of, of, of how these people had daily, everyday relationships. This is one of the, 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 the great paradoxes of Jewish life in the Middle Ages. On an everyday basis, Jews and Christians more or less did pretty well. But there were lines, there were limits. And the question is, when would they be crossed? And when could they, when could they explode? Why are Jewish butchers associated with ritual murder, for instance, down to modern times? Uh, you can go on and on and on. It's, it's one of the great strange questions. Why is it, I'm going to say go one more thing. Sure. Why, why is it that there is opposition to Jews having a Jewish state? I'm not talking about the policies. I'm not talking about occupation, no occupation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about the very opposition to the Jews having a state. It is, by definition, in my book, anti-Semitic. Why? Not for any of the reasons you're going to see. You sit here an hour, you won't come up with it. It's because the Roman law already says Jews may not hold public office. Jews may not be judges. Jews essentially can't have sovereignty. They ended the sovereignty of the, of the, the, the Nazis family in the Galil in the fifth century. And it runs through constantly. I read medieval legal doctrines and teachings and, 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 and whatever commentaries. It runs through at least the 18th century in so many words. Jews may not exercise sovereignty. So though it's expressed in, in, in purely secularized, laicized terms, opposition to a Jewish state as a Jewish state is rooted in this ancient medieval, early modern trope that the Jews may not exercise political power. It's somehow, you know, these things get, get, get lay, lay aside, secularized, like false concept of a, of a holy Christian body gets translated into the holiness of the American people, a pluribus unum, out of many one. You know, these things carry on. Well, that's my own, that's, uh, and it's not political, and it's not political statement. <laughs> it is not at all a political statement. It's simply a fact of life that it's a continuation of that trope the Jews can't have political power. Okay, thank you. We've got quite a few questions, but unfortunately we won't be able to answer all of them. Uh, I hope that maybe some of them will be answered in our next session next week, and I hope you all join us. Thank you very much, Professor Stowe. Thank you everyone for joining us, and um, we'll see you again. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>